Welcome back to the podcast. Today, my guest is author Keely Shenners. She wrote a wonderful book called How to Build a Home for the End of the World. Now, this book is published by Perennial Press, and they reached out to me towards the end of season two about having Keely come on the podcast to talk about it, but I was going into my summer hiatus, and so I said, well, let me read the book, and then once we're into season three, we can squeeze her interview in there. And I expected this to happen over the autumn of 2022, but I forgot about it. Um, I don't have an assistant and I have a lot of things going on and I things will slip my mind if I'm not reminded. Luckily, Perennial Press reminded me that we were talking about this. And so I said, okay, let's schedule her and <laughs> we'll do it then. And, and the reason I wanted to have her on after reading the book was because this book was the first I read since my undergraduate studies that reminded me of structuralism theory. I feel like structuralism theory is like this really weird theory where like the meaning of a text can be derived from its structure, which I don't think is always true, especially since many creatives don't use structure to tell their story. They use, well, in terms of the meaning of the story, like they'll use structure to basically make understanding the story easier, but it won't necessarily cr create a way to interpret the meaning of a story. Whereas with this particular book, I'm like, I feel like some of the meaning of the story can be taken from the structure. It makes sense to me. I don't know why it makes sense. I know I feel that. So yeah, let's have her on. And so eventually we scheduled the episode and I had the conversation with Keely. We do talk a certain extent about structuralism, uh, but not as much as I thought I would, simply because, just because I feel like it, just because I feel that it could be the focus of a conversation, I don't always have everything I need to actually have that conversation. <laughs> so sometimes it's just not the day for it, but um, it's sort of like, Sometimes I'll have conversations with authors about science fiction and the socio-political parallels that emerge in science fiction, which is a topic that I love and I can talk circles around it. But some days my brain just isn't working as far as that subject matter goes. And, I, and then I shut down. And today I was ready to go in on structuralism and I just completely shut down. But, we, but I, I do think that if you're a writer, this could be a very beneficial episode because we do talk about the writing process. We talk about MFA programs. We talk about uh, reader feedback and really important to this show, how family responds when a writer releases a book that may or may not be a critique of members of that family. So <laughs> it's a little gossipy, a little, a little small town in, in terms of, of that aspect of it. But uh, I think it's a really great inclusion as far as the literary conversations on this podcast, the art process conversations on this podcast. And I just want to thank Keely for being on the show. Here is my conversation with her and I'll see you on the other side. Thanks everybody. I haven't actually recorded an episode in a while because I tend to stagger them and then I take several months off and then I okay. and then I do like a bunch and then I stagger them again. So this is the first one uh, going into the next batch. So yeah. okay, well, I'm excited I'm for it. To be here. <laughs> and I should tell you that. So I'm coming to you from Cape Town. Yep. Uh, and tomorrow the president is giving a State of the Nation address. And because they're doing a rehearsal tonight, I think around seven o'clock my time, so in about an hour, they're going to fly these jets over the city and they're going to make a really loud noise. And I don't want you to be alarmed. <laughs> That's awesome. 
That is so cool. <laughs> we should be wrapped in, in about an hour or so. Sorry? Yeah. We should be wrapped in about an hour, so it shouldn't be a problem. I do have okay. an advisory for you as well. They've been doing work on my internet in the neighborhood all week. And all week, it's been going out just randomly. Oh, okay. So if that happens, we'll just try to log back on. Otherwise, I'll send an email to Perennial and let them know that we'll have to reschedule uh, just because okay. I don't control. Like I'm in the part, the really the only part of New York City that still has above ground communication lines. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and, so, and so they're always working on them bec- when the weather gets rough. You're originally from the Midwest, right? Yes, I'm from Illinois. How how did you end up in Cape Town? So I first, I was doing my undergrad in east of LA. That's where I met Maddie initially from Perennial Press. Uh, we went we went to the same university. And in my third year, I came to Cape Town to study abroad, which was just supposed to be for a semester. And then I fell in love and ended up getting married and I stayed here (laughs) and I've been here ever since pretty much. Do you think you'll be there indefinitely? Yeah, I think so. Cool. You like it there? I, yeah, I love it. It's a, it's a city that you hate to love and love to hate Cape Town, but, but I love it. (laughs) That's how I describe New York. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. Sometimes I'll say you're crazy if you love it, but if you hate it, you don't belong here. Yeah, exactly. But I guess all great <laughs> cities are like that. Hmm, exactly. Cool. So um, I'd like to start with just you're a writer. And I'm always interested in how people find writing. Can you tell, talk to me about a little bit about how you found your way to be being a writer? Mm. So, I mean, I've always been interested in writing ever since I was a kid. Um, I used to, you know, I would go and see a, a movie with my parents and then I would go home and start drafting the screenplay to the sequel of the movie. Uh, like there's floating around in my parents' house somewhere, a screenplay of like a Scooby-Doo (laughs) three that I wrote when I was eight. (laughs) And, um, as a teenager, I was super into fan fiction and, um, then slowly through some amazing teachers at my high school got introduced to the more canonical works like your Gatsby's and your Catcher in the Rise and... Um, then I started writing, you know, poetry and short stories when I was 19, I think, or 20, I, I wrote a book of short stories that I aspired to have published, but of course it never saw the light of day and I'm so glad that it didn't. (laughs) Um, and, and then I started working on my first novel, how to build a home for the end of the world actually in a creative fiction class uh, when I was in undergrad. I wrote the first 50 pages. Those 50 pages never made it into the final product, but uh, I had an idea to write a story about the end of the world and about a father and daughter going on a road trip. And I, I worked on that for the next five years. I, yeah, well, we're going to talk about the road trip um, because I've heard you talk about that before, uh, and I'm, I'm always interested in unpacking the seeds of any novel. But let's go back to how you used to write sequels to pre-existing <laughs> movies because I used to do that too, and I oh, thought yeah. I was the only one. And I, I, I do wonder if that's a thing with writers. Like, that's how we start. That's sort of the gateway drug. And, and I vaguely remember also, in addition to writing sequels, I once wrote a spin-off, like my version of Jurassic Park, only I called it Cretaceous Park, which is super original and different. And I remember my <laughs> teacher criticizing me and she goes, this is the same story. And I'm like, no, see, from a paleontology standpoint, this is more accurate because it's the Cretaceous period. <laughs> I love that. Just totally, totally adding the, the geek factor. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, I, and it's funny because I didn't even think about that, that, oh my God, I am a geek. But yeah, I, I just love that. Yeah, we just started off writing sequels and alternate versions of pre-existing things. But isn't that how it always begins? Yeah, you kind of you kind of start by copying, imitating, um, because you want to be a part of this thing that has moved you so much, even if it's something as flippant as Gooby Doo Two <laughs> in my case. <laughs> yeah, and then and then eventually, you know, all that copying and and imitating and remixing and spinning off, then that kind of gives you the foundation to eventually, you know, when you have a little bit more experience and a little bit more maturity, one hopes to start adding your own story or your own imagination to, to that foundation. Yeah. And it reminds me too of like, there's this, there's this movie called Finding Forrester where Sean Connery plays an author. Uh, I think they modeled him after J.D. Salinger. So he wrote like one great book and then he went into isolation in the Bronx. And then uh, this kid who lives in, in, in the same apartment building wants to be a writer. And so he ha so Sean Connery has him start typing an essay he wrote years ago. Just start mm. typing it word for word. And eventually it starts becoming something else. And by the end of it, it's like a, an original masterpiece. And I thought that that was such a great lesson in kind of how learning to create works in any medium, not just writing. Mm, absolutely. Cool novel, great concept, very relevant because uh, everything that's going on with the water supply in the Midwest and out West. Uh, what, what were the seeds for your novel as it concerns a road trip and a book on building houses? Right. Yeah. So, I know, by the way, uh, I know all the answers. I just, I have to get you talking. <laughs> I'm very happy to answer. <laughs> so um, I, in, in 2017, after my uh, semester abroad in Cape Town, I took a road trip with my dad from our hometown, Fox Lake, Illinois, to California, where I was doing my undergrad. And on the, and, and I had this, fiction course that I was going to take. So I was already thinking about what could I possibly write? You know, we had to write 50 pages of something at the end of the semester and we had to pitch it at the very beginning of the class. So I was thinking about the pitch while I was on the road trip with my dad and my dad's a carpenter. Uh, he's a very funny guy. Um, moves between saying like these very aphoristic, very spiritual like reflections on life to just like silly Midwestern dad jokes. And I became kind of interested in my dad as a character. And as we're driving through the US in January, 2017, uh, I really did feel this sense that not that the world was ending, but that the world had kind of already ended as we were driving on the kind of ruins of Route 66 and seeing ghost town after ghost town and thinking that you could probably write a story that is pretty much exactly as it happened, tell it as close to the grain of truth as possible and say that it was the end of the world and nobody would bat an eye because the circumstances in which we live are already quite apocalyptic so those are the seeds the seeds of the narrative uh, my dad is the character the road trip at the end of the world and when i decided that the catalyst for the end of the world should be a water crisis that was based off of living in la in 2014 and 2015 which was at the time you know some of the driest years on record they have since had drier years and the wildfires in, especially in Northern California can attest to that. Um, and then strangely enough, I, I used those first 50 pages of the novel that I had to apply for a master's in creative writing at UCT, which is in Cape Town. And I continued to work on the novel through 2017. 
and 2018. And in 2017, Cape Town had its worst drought on record uh, ever. And we weren't, you had, there were points at which we, our taps were turned off and you had to go and wait in a queue to, to get your water supply for the day. Um, there were signs everywhere saying not to wash your hands and to um, not flush a toilet and things because day zero was coming. Day zero was the day when we were going to run out of water. So all these things that I had kind of imagined as being like worst case scenarios in the novel were then things that me and everyone else in the city in which I live started to live through and um it was a it was a very anxious and agitated time but you also got the sense that like you know people were just carrying on life as normal um they were still going to work still doing their jobs still falling in love still breaking up still etc cetera, etc cetera. it wasn't like we all battened down the hatches and took out our guns and got ready for the apocalypse um, so that informed the novel as, as well in terms of how do you write a story about the end of the world? Um, and I wanted to write a story that was, was quite, yeah, where, where people kind of took care of each other more than they were fighting over resources. Although there is certainly conflict that the characters have to navigate. Now, the novel is is largely set um, in your hometown, mm, and yes. now that you don't live there, do you do you write more warmly with with that place in mind than my? Because I I found that living in New York for twenty years, like I write really warmly about my home state of Maine, and I really do a lot more research than I used to do when I lived there. I didn't even want to write about it at all. Mm, mm. Uh, well, it, I. Sorry. Oh, go go to... ahead. Yeah, I'd rather you talk. <laughs> um, do do I write more warmly about my hometown now that I don't live there anymore? I think in this particular book, I was actually quite scathing. <laughs> um, I kind of took that. Well, my protagonist is a teenage girl, and when I was a teenage girl in my town, I felt like it was a place where nothing happened and it was boring and I was almost kind of like trapped there um, and, you know, loved my family to bits, but I, I had some kind of resentment towards them in the way that they didn't have big dreams of leaving our town. Like I had big dreams and I put that into the book, um, especially through Mary Beth's perspective. Um, and almost kind of exaggerated by saying, not only is it a town where nothing happens, but it's a town where nobody lives. And not only do does the family not have aspirations of moving somewhere else, but they're vehement that they're going to be the last family standing in this town where nobody else lives. So um, I, I took those kind of angsty, resent, somewhat resentful feelings. And, and I did exaggerate them in my novel, but I imagine now that I've gone through that process, if I were to write about my hometown again, I would be very loving towards it. And I do have a lot of love for my home. I just visited my folks uh, last year in June and I loved being back. I love the smell. I love the, the there's so much green that, I don't get in the place where I now live and yeah, all that, all that nostalgia <laughs> was adequately fed. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, I asked that because, um, I'll, like I said, I, I, I've been kind of going through a transition where I have started thinking more warmly about a place that I, I couldn't find it within me to write anything good about. <laughs> and so <laughs> now that you've lived far away for a while, I guess uh, things changed a little bit. Mm. Can we talk about your writing practice? I'm interested in um, 
How do you write every day? How often do you write? Oh gosh. Um, I would say that I write every day, but it's not always fiction. Um, so, so I have, I have my fiction career and then I also work as an art critic. So I'd say my time, if you were to look at like a year, uh, as just a cross section, my time is kind of split 50, 50 between writing for the art world, um, and then writing for fiction. Do you have a routine? Do you prefer to like write in the mornings or in the evenings or is it? Yeah, I, I, tend, I tend to wake up and start writing immediately and probably write until four or five o'clock every day and then, and then tap out. <laughs> oh, okay. So <laughs> it's like a full nine to five. So one of the debates that I had, it started in my MFA program and now I just kind of ask every writer on here. Uh, what their thought is on thinking, because I my position is thinking is writing. So if I'm thinking about writing, I'm writing. But there are, there were so many people in my program who refused to accept that that if they weren't sitting at a typewriter or a laptop, actually writing. A typewriter. Think, no, yeah. Oh, there's like this undercurrent of people who are just going back to typewriters. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little like laptops are good. Just go with laptops. But um, yeah. And, and so I was just trying to, I was always trying to convince people that if I'm doing the dishes, that's writing because I'm thinking about what I'm about to write. And, and it's, it's, I would say it's 60, 40. I'm in the 40 percentile that, accepts that well thinking is writing i don't know because mm. mm. <laughs> I, I, mean, I have a hard time I, oh go ahead go ahead yeah sorry um i i always say that that writing is thinking um so the same thing that that you're saying and um i let me let me find a way to word this better um I'd say that although although I appreciate the discipline of sitting down at my desk every day and kind of recording the things that I think, so that's not necessarily writing sentence to sentence, point A to point B, but I do lots of note taking in my writing process, both for shorter essays and for novels. Um, then, then I'm giving myself the space to think and to write down what I'm thinking rather than to craft something uh, that, that's perfect the first time. And, you know, when I do the dishes, when I take a shower, those are when some of the best ideas come out and you try to write them down as quickly as possible. For me, the worst is that I have my best idea sometimes right as I'm falling asleep and then I wake up and write them down and then I'm awake and then I'm awake for another hour. Or sometimes first thing in the morning, you know, I wake up from a dream and maybe I need to write the dream down or it gives me some idea for something that I need to put into the book. Um, so I, I'm thinking about what I'm writing, I feel like, constantly. Uh, but it is important to to also make the time to record what you're thinking. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. My my biggest asset as a writer is the voice memo app on my phone. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's 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 perfect for those moments where you can't really sit down and, and take notes, but you can just quickly hit record and just be like, uh, you know, especially like when exactly. I'm hiking, when I'm hiking, that's, that's when a lot of things come. Um, mm. I would say entire short stories that have been submitted to journals have been 
formed while I was hiking. Amazing. Yeah, I, I run, I run as well. And I have a lot of ideas when I'm running. So you need to strike a balance, I guess, between sitting down at your desk and kind of pushing your brain a little bit, but then also like moving away from the desk, moving away from the journal, moving away from the typewriter, if that is what you like to write on and giving your brain room to breathe because then that's sometimes when the juicy bits kind of get released. Yes, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, what was your MFA program like? Uh, I'm always interested in the different program. I went through one at Sarah Lawrence College where it was two years, and we, you know, every term we had one craft class, one workshop, and then we had to attend like a, t like a certain amount of talks where guests would come in and talk. Yeah, so I did my MFA in Cape Town with Imran Kavadia. He was the he's the head of the creative writing department, which used to be a part of the English department. But Imran pissed off enough people in the English department that he got his own <laughs> one man department with, <laughs> with ten of us every year, <laughs> ten to twelve, and um, you know. It actually suited me very well, but I can definitely see how it wouldn't suit most students. We had one workshop the first semester, and then it was a total free for all for the next three semesters that we had. So we had one semester of workshopping when all of our ideas were kind of in their most nation stages. And then we were kind of left to be independent for the next year and a half, which I think, I hope I thrived in because um, I enjoy, I'm quite disciplined myself and I enjoy creating without too much feedback, you know, on a regular basis. But I know a lot of students in the same year, in the same program as me, uh, weren't really able to cope without having, you know, regular disciplined meetings with their supervisor or with other students. And they either didn't finish or kind of made their own little club of fellow students or writers in our city to meet with and get feedback from and 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 that's how they did it yeah but it was very hands off <laughs> which was great for me what do you think the the most valuable thing you got from that program is for you now um imran was very good about telling us to kill our darling and to go at our manuscripts with the red pen. And when he first used to talk about it, I used to like pshaw and say, don't take away my adjectives. I love my adjectives and my adverbs. He used to say no adjectives, no adverbs. Like the more adjectives you use, like, the closer you're getting to fascism or something like that. I don't know. He would, he would be very, he would be over the top sometimes. And, um, but, but when I actually started getting to a place with my project where it was almost, there it is. Sorry. Oh, hey, it's fine. I love aviation. So it's one of my obsessions. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it wasn't that loud. Um, it was louder yesterday. Uh, let me let me go back uh, and say that, yeah, Im Imran was very good about giving us the tough love and telling us to go at our manuscripts with the red pen. Uh, and at first, I used to push on him and say that I loved my adjectives and my adverbs and... I loved my long meandering passages where nothing happened, but 
when I got to a stage with my project where it was so big that I had a hard time getting a handle on it, I really valued that advice. Um, to just, you know, when in doubt, be concise and, and kind of keep the story moving. And that'll do you as a writer more favors, actually, than, than the reader. But the reader benefits from that as well, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, when I was a writing tutor in my undergrad, the big thing was, if you can say it in three, why say it in five words, you know, uh, and, mm. and to really just boil it down to the most efficient and effective way to get people through the page. Um, I used to think that I didn't really get anything from my MFA. Um, and because what I wanted from it was to come out with contacts to come out with people in the industry that I could go to, uh, or maybe even just to have a better sense of what a writing practice should look like. And mm -hmm. to, to a certain extent, I felt like it had taken my, the voice I had developed for years had kind of taken it away. And I had to struggle to find it again in a couple of years after I graduated. But somebody close to me said, well, no, if there's anything you got from it, it's that you don't give a shit anymore what people think. And I'm like, mm. really? She's like, and she's, she goes, yeah, you, you used to whine every time somebody said something negative about something you've written or a film you've made. And now you just say, oh, fuck them. That's enough. I don't know if it's worth the tuition, but that's enough. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because the, the, I mean, the feedback that some of these, these peers will give you is so brutal. I, I mean, I don't know about down there, but... Uh, here, oh, they they did did, did not hold back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I think I think in our program, we were a lot nicer to each other. Uh, but people were coming up with some wild wild stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that sounds nice. See, some part of me wanted that uh, that's a, that level of support in the program. But uh, I guess, you know, we all get what we need when we need it. Mm. Did you do those illustrations in your book? My dad did them. Cool. I asked him if he could draw what he thought the end of the, what a home for the end of the world would look like. And that's what he drew. And, and I decided to put them on the inside cover of the book. Yeah. I like it when, when books have stuff like that. Um, it's very rudimentary, but it adds a character to the story. The dining table built for 12 was seating 20 at least. Okay, I love it. It's fine. But here's the thing. Okay. When I was in my undergrad, I had a writing tutor who's like, who gave me shit for using the word seem. He seemed angry or he seemed, and this, this brought this to mind because it's indecisive in description. And she goes, you need to know, is this person angry? Is this person, does it actually seat 20? So, and I didn't agree with her then and I don't agree with her now, but have you ever come across writing advice where like, if you're indecisive on the description, well, does it seat 20? or more, uh, where people are like taken aback by it, where it takes them out of the story. Cause I couldn't believe that me saying the word seem took this person out of the story, or if they were just nitpicking because they felt they had to give some sort of feedback and they couldn't come up with something else. I, I, I personally don't live by too many writing rules. Um, but you know, you can, with those indecisive things, you can, build so much of your character, you know, like in, in, for Mary Beth, she is, uh, living in a house alone with her family and everything is kind of bleak and lonely. So for her to walk into a party for the first time in God knows how long, maybe the first time in her life and to not how, know how many people are sitting at the table, then I feel like that is a small way to give her a little bit of character or give the reader a little bit of her perspective. 
Yeah. We're just almost overwhelmed. She might even be exaggerating about how many people are actually sitting at this table. She's like, it must be 20. It's probably only 13 <laughs> as opposed to 12. Um, so, you, yeah, like, seem, absolutely. You should use that word. Um, and, and you can use it to great effect, I think. Um, it's it's all about the effect and the tone that that you're striking. Like yeah. it doesn't always have to be by the book, unless your character, I suppose, is somebody who's by the book and very analytical and would be able to see everything clearly as it is upon walking into a room for the first time. That's that's a great great defense. Of... <laughs> yes. It, it... That's perfect. That's the perfect answer. That's what I wanted to hear. We're going to have to send this episode to this particular person, although I don't remember her name at this point. Um, <laughs> well, I hope, I, I hope she finds it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, what's, what sort of feedback have you been getting about your novel? I'm interested in um, how the world responds to different writers and how they, how they take some of the reviews. Because you have quite a, bit of, quite a few reviews on uh, Goodreads. Yeah, I mean, I've been very pleasantly surprised with how people are responding to the book. Um, they seem to be very moved by it. I get a lot of messages of people who have just finished the book saying that they're crying, which is a nice thing to hear. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, hmm, yes, I have done my job. You are in shambles. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, yeah, the response has been great. Um, my, maybe I'll, I'll go a little bit personal and say that when my book came out, it did create kind of a, a rupture in, in my family with this character being so close to who my dad is. And, um, you know, my, my mom and, and other members of my family being quite taken aback to have this representation, you know, that that was maybe not very kind to this person who they love. And that fucked me up a little bit, you know, the book coming out and, and having to deal with those conversations and and heal some wounds that hadn't been healed before the book came out. That kind of informed my perception personally of how the book is being received. Mm. Well, a family responses are uh, a major topic of discussion on, on this show sometimes because uh, <laughs> some of the writing I gravitate towards the most is derived from uh, family experiences. And it's something that I've dealt with too, as a writer where, you know, I've a few years back, I, I released a novella called objects and giants and, it's a fictional story, but emotionally it's rooted in a lot of truth. And the mm. first email I get back was from my mother, who's like, you shouldn't be writing about other people. I'm like, what? Why? <laughs> What's the point of writing? <laughs> and she was just embarrassed that I actually had the audacity to write about, in a fictional context, my uh, oh. relationship with certain members of my family. Um, and so that, yeah, that's interesting to hear that that was their reaction, that that it stirred up some stuff because um, it happens to me every time I publish. Yeah, it, it goes with the territory, I suppose. <laughs> and I had kind of braced myself for it. You know, I wanted to be, I knew that I was going to get myself into trouble and I did it anyway. Which is something that I have been reflecting on in the past year since, since the book came out about is there something about being an artist, whether you're a writer or a director or a painter or whatever, where you kind of know that what you're making is going to hurt people's feelings and you kind of sadistically do it anyway, <laughs> because you feel like it needs to live in the world or, 
it expresses some truth that you want to share? I don't know. Well, I don't think it's sadistic at all. I, I once had a poet on here named Mindy Cronenberg. Um, and I asked, we talked about this as well because she she um, mentioned, you know, how family members are very careful around her now. Uh, mm. You know, you can't go to Thanksgiving without having those select people tiptoeing around you, whereas some people just don't care. They're like, write about me. I could give a shit. Um, and I think it just... Uh, it is what it is. Like they can accept that you're a writer who writes from your own personal experience. And that's that. Um, it, it is telling though, it, at least for me in which of my family members read and don't read because um, the ones that tend to tend to read or have some semblance of, literary literary analysis in them get it oh you're you're a creative person who's using uh metaphors and stuff to talk about your you know your struggles growing up or whatever i'm like yeah that's basically what i do I'm like oh okay <laughs> like you watercolor i do this uh but then right. the ones who take it personally and don't want you to do that those are the ones who tend to not be um yeah, readers. That's it. That's it. That's just, they're just not readers. And um, it, it, it also tends to be the people who um, show a lot less interest in how I'm doing. I found that to be true, too. Um, mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Anyway, mm -hmm. it, it's going to be different experiences for everybody. But yeah, family can be tough if you're creative. Yeah, I, there's a I'll, I'll have to double check who it is, but there's a Polish writer who says that the moment a writer is born into a family, the family is ruined. <laughs> and I love I that. Love that. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. That's a perfect quote. I'm going to have to extract that. Um, well, it has any of this affected how you'll pursue the next project? Oh gosh. No. Um, well, this, the next book that I'm working on is a lot less personal, but it's even more, it's even weirder and it's very like sexy. So now that my family has healed from being exposed in my first novel, they're going to get my second novel, which has like an anal scene within the first 10 pages and they're going to have to deal with that. <laughs> All right. Well, as long as you're still invited to Thanksgiving, uh, it should be okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it'll be fine. Yeah. They, can, they can take it. They're tough cookies. I got reading your book. I got to thinking about structuralism. Do you know about structuralism as the literary theory? Where give, like, me, give me give me a rundown. Sure. Where there's this theory. I think it's an asinine theory, to be honest. Unless a book is, unless the author is deliberately using structure as a way of telling you what the meaning of a book is. It makes no, it, it, I don't think it's applicable, but for some reason, uh, your, your book brought this up in structuralism. The idea is that the structure of any story tells you what the meaning of that story truly is. Uh, again, I don't 100% buy it cause I don't think a lot of people are thinking about structure when they create these things, at least in terms of the theme of a story. But um, I also haven't had a conversation about structuralism on the podcast. And since I thought of it while reading your book, I thought we could talk about it. But um, we could also just skip it because, no, again, I'm, it's I'm an asinine I'm theory. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Well, I, just... I mean, <laughs> uh, that um, epigraph that's at the beginning of the book, um, it's, it's a quote from Hubbard Cobb, which is a real book that, that my father carries around. And he says it's the best book on do-it-yourself carpentry if you're ever interested in building a house yourself. Um, I'm trying to find it. It says, the first question that comes up is naturally how much of a job it is to build a house yourself. Well, it's a big job. On the other hand, there is nothing too complicated or difficult about it. If you can just do these three steps, measure, cut, and nail, and almost anyone can, then you can build most of the house yourself. 
Hubbard Cobb, your dream home, how to build it for less than $3,500. And, and that epigraph was always going to be the epigraph of the book. Um, and I always knew that the book was going to be in three parts. It would, it would begin with kind of a rupture of the home life in Fox Lake. And then it would go, part two would be the road trip. And then part three would be LA. And I felt that those three words, measure, cut, and nail, actually were nice metaphors for what I wanted to do with each of those parts of the book. So measure was kind of taking the temperature of what's going on in this world, what's going on with these characters and introducing everyone. Cut is kind of, you know, they're cutting across the landscape and you're feeling the scenes of their relationships tearing. Um, and what, what do they do if, if everything that they know has been kind of cut away? And then nail is kind of like the final nail in the coffin, if you will. Um, the, the last rupture that kind of brings all of the characters who have lost each other back together uh, in an unexpected way. So in a way, it is like literally quite structural <laughs> yeah well as you're talking about it, i'm like wait a minute i wasn't off because i doubt myself so much when i read books and <laughs> i do think that this book could be written about in terms of looking at it through the lens of structuralism just based on what you said but also like i don't know it's like a road trip to la you're going to a place where that's has major issues with their water supply anyway right, right. <laughs> so it's like going from one to the other yeah, oh. I'm glad I bring them up, even though I don't know 100% know why I'm bringing it up. Um, no, you get, you get <laughs> you feel it intuitively. I yeah. Guess, which is a good thing. Yeah, I did, I did think a lot about how it was going to work. Yeah, it was all going to be kind of a metaphor for building some new house in the end. Yeah, one house, it begins with one house kind of crumbling and then ends with, a new home being built. Yeah. Great. Cool. So, um, I tried looking for this book on Amazon and could not find it. Is it not listed there? <laughs> I don't think it's listed. I think, um, I think perennial press is pretty, cause they're a small press. They're pretty adamant about either selling directly or selling through like indie bookstores and stuff. Oh, okay. So I'll send think... people to the Perennial Press website. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and even though I got a PDF of it to review for the podcast, I'm still going to buy it because it's a really good book. And I'll oh, talk about you. I'll talk about it more in the intro, uh, which I'll record after. But um, I'm glad that I was invited to talk with you. Uh, and it took yeah, a long time to schedule the episode because I had a lot of things going on. And uh, but I'm, I'm glad that we finally made this work. And I hope that you keep me on your list of people to reach out to when you come up with a new book. I will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anyway, um, I'll let you go so you don't miss those fighter jets. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> I wouldn't want to miss those. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you, Eric, for your time and your questions and Thank for you. reading the book. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. So that was my conversation with Keely Shinners, author of How to Build a Home for the End of the World. If you're interested in buying the book, it's for sale direct through Perennial Press. I've put a link in the show notes. Thank you, and I'll see you on the next episode.